Good evening. Sound like everybody's having a good time. Always a good time. That's right, Kevin. Joy in the house of the Lord. Amen. As they continue to trickle in. All right. Uh, we're going to start off with prayer tonight. Uh, do we have any prayer requests we need to remember? Remember that. Gary Keenwood with Jamie. Um, the surgeon, the other surgeon's Friday, he does not recommend her having a total colonoscopy. And because Lisa's doctor says she needs to have it, <laughs> so it causes more, you know, stiffness and more pain for her. And um, I, we just need God's guidance on this. I don't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. But um, I got to make the call on my way to get the colonoscopy. So if you would just pray about that, if you would. Mm -hmm. and, Please continue praying for my husband. Remember that. Remember Jamie. Willie? Really? All right. Remember Willie's friend. I got a call from Terry uh, earlier, and uh, Wilma is not doing good at all, so let's remember them tonight. A heart satisfied? Remember that. So remember uh, Ruth and Kim and the family. I'll get, invite everyone down to the altar. Go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, ask Brother Bo if he'll lead us tonight.
as the singers come, let's worship the Lord. So overwhelmed today. We're so small. But praise the Lord, his love is so big. Um, they told me, bar up a pom pom. Our newborn king to see, bar up a pom pom. Our finest gifts we bring, bar up a pom pom. To lay before the king, bar up a pom pom, rap a pom pom, rap a pom pom. So to honor him, bar up a pom pom when we come, babe. I am a poor boy too, bar up a pom pom. I have no gift to bring, bar up a pom That's fit to give our king, bar up a pom pom, rap a pom pom, rap a pom pom. Shall I play for him? Bar up a pom pom on my drum. Mary nodded. Bar up a pom pom. The ox and lamb kept. Time, bar up a pom pom. I played my drum for him, bar up a pom pom. I played my best for him, bar up a pom pom, rap a pom pom, rap a pom pom. Then he smiled at me, bar up a pom pom, me and my drum. There are times in this life when fear is so heavy and burdens weigh on your mind. You are weak in the knees and no strength can you find, but just hold on helps right on time my jesus is always on time and though you may see a valley he sees the mountain you'll be standing on when sees what we don't 
I've seen God's children walk through the darkest of midnights. I've witnessed faith put to the test. And I have watched as the storms blew and with the thunder, but in each trial, he knows what's best and i am so glad he knows what's best and though you may see a valley he sees the mountain you'll be standing on when all And he looks ahead past the hurt and the pain To a place where the peace passes all understanding He sees the sun through the rain And though you may see your vow I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful yes you have and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice, for you have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good with every of the goodness of God for your goodness it's running after it's running after me for your goodness it's running after it keeps running after me with my life laid down I surrender now Lord I give you everything 
Chris, it's running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. So faithful. And all my life you have been so, so kind. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, thank you, Lord. I will sing of the goodness of God. Man, praise God. All right, church, open up your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 4. While you guys turn there, I can uh, just share with you a brief testimony how uh, we came across this message. As, as you guys know, we're, we're going through a series of, of Luke, but I was really, um, I was really contemplating uh, what message to preach to God's people. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be the last message that I preach you know, for 2022. Um, so I really wanted to uh, just give you guys a message of encouragement. And I was, there was a certain passage that I was, uh, that I was really studying and just was just, just overwhelmed with how good it was. And I really wanted to use that passage to kind of encourage you and to, to kind of cast a little bit of vision and um, just where God wants us to go uh, in 2023, according to his word. And, and, um, but also the next passage um, in, in the series that we're preaching oh, was also good. And that's the problem that you run into. All of God's word is just so good, right? Where do you, how do you make that decision? And it has to be God. And so in prayer and, and, and just seeking him, you know, the, the Lord just told me to preach both messages. So you guys are in for, for a treat. Um, uh, so 
the Lord was just able to show me how he wanted me to deliver his message. And outside of this explanation, you know, you guys don't have to worry about staying here for, for a long hour. So um, let's just praise God. So we're reading from, uh, from Luke 4, and we're continuing the next uh, uh, part. We, if you guys remember, we, we read about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, and we're, we're going into the next part of, uh, of this passage here that the, the writer gave us, the writer Luke. So we're going to be reading uh, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. So if you found your way there, uh, if you would please stand up to honor the Word of God. Uh, one of the things that I just want to mention is just kind of uh, go over just what the pastor mentioned this morning, right? We live in a country where we have the freedom, the privilege to have God's Word um, at, with us at all times, right? You guys don't have to just take my Word. You guys can, 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 can read the Scriptures for yourself. So don't, let's not take that for granted. Church, let's let's seek God's word with a hunger and a desire just to know more about our Savior. Amen. Amen. Luke four, beginning at chapter uh, verse fourteen, and we're going to read to twenty one, and it says, "And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region around uh, region roundabout." And he taught in their synagogue, in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for t to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he turned, or he found, excuse me, the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20, and he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were f fastened upon on him. Let us, uh, uh, verse 21, excuse me. And he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we just come before you today once again to say thank you, Lord, to be in your house. Father, we thank you for the word that you have given us, Father. We just pray um, just that you would open up our hearts to receive your word, Father. Lord, I'm so grateful for the blessing to be able to read and understand your word, Lord, uh, not as a least list of do's and don'ts, Lord, but that I can know the author, that I can have a relationship with you, Father, that I can see what pleases you, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, because the things that you have revealed to me have not been given to me by man, but by the Holy Spirit. And that is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Lord. So I pray for my brothers and sisters today, Lord, that as they seek you, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them through your scriptures and that you would, they would be encouraged. Father, I just thank you. I praise you. I ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And the church says, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we come to the next part of the scriptures here in, in the gospel of Luke. And as we read this, you will notice a, a couple of things. For example, if we look at verses 14 and verse 15, it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit unto Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region around about. And he taught in their synagogue, being glorified of all. So we, we, we learn a couple of things as, as, as we read and we study this. One of the first things that we learn about the, 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 this particular verse is that Luke, the, the writer, he's not necessarily 
concern in the chronological telling of the, uh, of the, of the life of Christ. He's more interested in the, log in the logical telling of the life of Christ. What I mean by that is he's not really trying to give you a timeline of events of what happened in Jesus' life. He's trying to write to, to, to show you, uh, to, 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 to prove something to you. So he's not going in chronological order. He's not going, uh, um, you know, uh, by the events that happen next. We see this before when we talked about John the Baptist, when he was, when he introduced John the Baptist out in the wilderness, he said that John the Baptist had uh, been imprisoned and he was kind of just going ahead, if you will. So he wasn't so much interested in, in, in going um, in a timeline. Hopefully that makes sense to you. He, he was more interested in, 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 uh, in, in revealing to you who this, uh, who this Jesus Christ was. You guys got to remember, uh, uh, Luke was a, a Gentile uh, writer who was writing for Theophilus, who we believe was also a, a Gentile. So he had a purpose for, for writing this. Now, one of the things also that, that you may or may not know as you read this is that by this point, as, as he's writing this particular uh, account of Jesus' life, many of the stories that you're familiar with have already happened. Many of the stories that you read about in, in the Gospel of John, you, we think about uh, uh, how Jesus got introduced to Peter and John and Andrew. And, and So he had already been introduced to these disciples, even though Luke doesn't go there. By this point, Jesus was already introduced. He already had disciples following him. By this point, Jesus had already performed the miracle at the wedding in Cana where he turned water into wine. He had already been to Jerusalem for the first Passover. He had already cleared the temple out. Jesus had already uh, uh, went and had to stop in Samaria, and he already talked to the woman at the well, and he already talked to Nicodemus. I swapped those two around. He had already talked to Nicodemus. He had already talked to the woman at the well. Jesus had already done all these things by the time that he, we enter this scene of Jesus coming into Galilee, uh, into, Galilee into the place where, uh, where he was born. So hopefully you guys understand that. Um, if you guys remember in, in his story talking to Nicodemus, Jesus, uh, uh, Nicodemus calls him Rabbi Master. So Jesus already had a fame of him of being a of being a rabbi. This is not just something that they threw out uh, uh, carelessly. So Jesus had already uh, had established himself. And what really got to me, and I'm not going to be able to explain it in, in this part of the message. It'll have to be the next time. But Jesus had already said this in the in, in the Gospel of John. Jesus tells us that many had believed in his name in Jesus when they saw the miracles which he did. The scripture says, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. And we will see this as we continue. If you continue reading in the chapter, at one point, they are amazed by his teachings and the way that he's doing it. And in the next moment, they're trying to push him off a cliff. So that just goes to teach us one thing. Well, again, this is not part of the message, but not everybody who speaks well of you is, is going to support you. So we see this about Jesus Christ, how, how he knew all this. And that really... That really um, Shows us that, that lip service doesn't mean anything. It's about what's in our hearts. And Jesus knew this. Verse 16 says that he came into Nazareth and where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up uh, for to read. As I was reading this, there's that song that that that, that song that uh, it was from a program or something, but it, it goes something along the lines of where everybody knows your name. Maybe you guys are familiar with it. I'm not going to sing it for you, but but I think it's like the theme song to Cheers or something. But that's where Jesus came, where everybody knew his name. That's where he was. Everybody knew him. You see that man right there? That Jesus? That's Mary and Joseph's boy. Yeah, that that's Jesus. Oh, he's some kind of a fancy rabbi now. They knew him. 
And so he enters into the synagogue, and, 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 and we have been, uh, we have this picture of what a service is. Um, this is, since I was little to the age that I am now, this is just what I've been used to uh, seeing in services. Normally what happens is you come in uh, into the church, uh, a preacher or someone stands up behind the pulpit, they kind of introduce the service, they have a... a, a, a um, prayer time, time for worship, they have a, a reading of the Bible, and then they preach on the message. And the whole time, this man, this preacher, is standing behind the pulpit. That's just what we're used to. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's just the format that we're used to. Amen? But in their times, it was a little bit different. So what they would do is they, they, he would read it, and then he would sit down, but he wouldn't go back to a pew. He would just sit down, and then everybody would sit around him at his feet. Typically, his disciples would sit around first, and then everybody else would kind of sit around and, and, and hear uh, this man, this rabbi, this teacher, kind of go in and, and explain the scriptures. So that's that's what would happen. So so I'm trying to paint this picture for you. So Jesus stands up. Uh, he he reads from uh, from the book of Isaiah, and it says that there was a a a a, a book. Uh, I'm sure you guys understand that, but they didn't have books in those times, so it was a scroll, right? The King James translates it as book, but it was a scroll. It wasn't a book that, 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 we, that we flip. It was a road. And, and they brought him, they brought him the, the scroll, and it says that he read. I've read commentators. Commentators were saying that, 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 that typically what would happen is he would just pick up where he left off, where, where the previous uh, 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 person left off. And can you, uh, can, can you imagine how amazing this scene is for Jesus just to kind of pick up and, and, and the scripture that he read was about him. But can I tell you, it's just as amazing if Jesus would have picked this particular verse out. I want you to think in your mind how excited you would be if, if Jesus was to say, hey, hey, Sandhill, I have a message for you. And he would preach through a message. That's what these people were witnessing. There was a message that Jesus had for them. Now, this message, this, this, this particular part of scripture that he read was from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 61. Uh, and, and he read these verses, and, and, and it was a messianic uh, prophecy, if you will. There we see it in, 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 verses, uh, in verses 18 and 19. It says, and the spirit of the Lord is upon, upon me because he has anointed me. To preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the deliverance to the captive, and receiving of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are that are uh, bruised, uh, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This was a, a, a messianic uh, a, a, a prophecy. That's what this was, and Jesus was was was, was reading from this. And he preached the shortest message that you will ever hear. And I'm sure you guys have heard just a wonderful expository preachers who can kind of take the scriptures and just paint this beautiful uh, message of them. And they can deliver a message. But here we see one of the shortest messages ever. And it was so wonderful. He said that this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. That's all he said. Can you, can you imagine this, that, that Jesus is pointing to himself? Now, if you guys have remembered, up to this point, we have had about 12 uh, testimonies of who Jesus was. Do you remember the angel Gabriel who appeared to, to, uh, to Mary and tell him that, that she was going to have a child? You guys remember that prophecy, right? He also appeared to Zacharias. He also, uh, Mary also prophesied. So you have Gabriel, you have Mary, you have Elizabeth, you have Zacharias, you have uh, 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 Anna and, and, and Simeon. You have the angels that appeared to the, to the shepherds. You have the shepherds that, that, that proclaim who Jesus is. You have John the Baptist. Think about it. You have the Holy Spirit who descends on Jesus and says and, 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 and shows that this is the, the one that the scriptures were about. You have God the Father say, this is my, my beloved son. So you have all these testimonies. You even had Satan. Satan, yeah, the devil, Satan, the enemy, the adversary. He even said that this was Jesus, that this was the son of God. This was the Messiah. This is the one. You guys remember when he said, if you are the son of God, do this? That was him saying, hey, listen. 
You have been set aside. You have a special calling. Well, do, this, do it this way. So all these people had prophesied, but in the book of Luke, in the book of Luke, this is the first time that he acknowledges that these scriptures that were written about the Messiah were about him. And I want you to understand how important this is because these are the people that are disenfranchised. These are the people that are in captivity. These are the people who are, are, are just let down, not just by the government, but by the religious uh, leaders who are, are not really looking out for the poor. This, this message that he preaches, that he's come to preach the gospel to the poor, that's good. That's wonderful. You guys know that the gospel means good news. He has come to give good news to the poor. How many of you guys remember ever struggling not being able to, to, to meet ends, right? You don't know how you're going to be able to pay your bills, and you get that, that unexpected check in the mail. You get that unexpected phone call that says, hey, you know that money you wanted to borrow? I got you. That good news. The poor loves good news. I'm not just talking about uh, uh, monetarily poor. Even someone who is brokenhearted, who is poor in spirit, they love good news. That's who Jesus Christ came to. Let's take a look at this, uh, uh, at, at this verses here in, in, in the prophecy. The first thing that it says, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the first thing that he says. And let's take a look at the poor for a second. I don't mean to be ugly or mean. Um, um, I, I say this in love. But, but the poor are unattractive. Can, can we say that? I'm not just talking about physical looks, okay? Unattractive. Meaning that there's nothing that you would want to uh, 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 aspire to be uh, when you look at a poor person. And what I mean by that is how many of you have grown up... Uh, in situations where you weren't able to make ends meet and you said, um, I, I want to be poor when I grow up. Now, some of you might be grateful for growing up uh, in a poor situation because it has made you into the hardworking man or woman that you are today and, and, and be able to have the things that you have. But nobody ever wants to be poor. That is not something that you desire to be. And that's what Jesus came to. No one uh, ever, ever, ever... Uh, aspires this and as a matter of fact the poor they're not able to pay you back meaning that whatever you give them you have to give them expecting nothing in return because they don't have nothing for you right now a lot of people will talk about the poor you hear it on the news all the time you hear that this that's the main topic and they use them in a way to manipulate the masses right they talk like they want to help but they're not really invested. But that's who Jesus came to. These are the people that Jesus came to. He goes on to say, in the next part, that he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Can I tell you that sometimes the brokenhearted are not the easiest to minister to? How many more times are you going to tell me your sad story? Just get over it. How many of you remember the, the, the first time you were brokenhearted? Maybe in a relationship? Maybe, maybe uh, your boyfriend or your girlfriend that you really loved, they broke up with you and the whole world was going to end. It's over! Maybe it's a little bit more serious than that, right? Because we know that the first boyfriend or girlfriend, that's, most of the time, that's, you get over it quick. But how about if you're brokenhearted because you lost a loved one? We just sat and witnessed the celebration of a life yesterday as we saw the funeral and just um, people that we love and we care for uh, heartbroken. And we care for them. And there's really nothing that we can really do to kind of uh, fix that, their situation. We just have to be patient with them. Now, the world will teach you that time heals all wounds. And that sounds good. That sounds really good. But that's not true. Time doesn't do nothing but begin and end. The only one that can truly heal a broken heart is God. 
Now, to minister to a person who's brokenhearted, you need patience. You need love for that person. Because that person might be going through ups, and they might be going through downs. And as I read this, I thought of those people that are in my life that are brokenhearted. And how I just want to hug them. I want to embrace them and tell them it's going to be all right to trust in God. But they're unable to do so because they're brokenhearted. And they go through moments when they're, they, 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 they feel like they trusted in God. Only the next day to come crashing back down. And as much as we love them, sometimes you might grow a little impatient with them. Why can't they just get over it? But that's what Jesus came to. I'm so grateful for him to have patience and love with me when I was brokenhearted. When I needed that embrace. When I could trust in him. That's who he came for. We continue to read. And he says, to the, uh, excuse me, church, to preach deliverance to the captive. To preach deliverance to the captive. How many people that we know that are captive, whether they're captive in a relationship that's not going well? whether they're captive in a, because of an addiction to a substance. They're enslaved to this thing and they just can't be free. And Jesus came to them to bring deliverance, to show that whatever is holding them captive no longer has to. That's who the Messiah came to. What a great God we serve, church. Those things were true then. And they're still true today. He goes on to say, the recovering of the sight to the blind. You guys know my testimony. I, I, I actually resonate with this message very, very much. Now, here's one thing about the blind, especially those who either don't know they're blind or don't act the blind. Two of the comments that I get the most, that I hear the most, is, you see that thing over there? And the answer that I always have is, nope. <laughs> I do not. You see, because I don't walk around with a cane, I don't have a CNI dog, so it is easy for people to forget that I'm blind. My loving wife, who has, uh, other than, than my Lord and Savior, has been the closest to me, she has been to, with me into these uh, eye doctor visits and stuff and has shed tears. Even she forgets how blind I am. It's easy to forget that these people are blind. And it's so easy to just get upset. Why can't they just see? Why can't they see their mistakes? Why can't they see that the life that they're living is just going to lead them to destruction? Why can't they see? Bible is very clear why can't they see they can't see because they're blind because they are not able to see and that's what Jesus came to he 
came to the ones that uh, did not see their mistakes. And we all have a testimony here of how we came to know Christ. Some hit rock bottom before they were able to see. Others had deceived themselves to thinking that they were doing very well. But each and every one of us was blind before we came to Christ. You're who he came for. I'm who he came for. He goes on to tell us. To set at liberty them that are bruised. And those people that are bruised. Those people that have been hurt before. Are afraid to get hurt again. They don't want to take chances. Because how many times have they, have they been let down? How many times have they went to church only to have the church let them down? How many times have they put their trust in a person only to have that person let them down? These people are afraid. That's who he came to. That's who Jesus Christ came to. We see here about the poor, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, we went to the, we went to uh, early in the week, we went to the doctor to take Jonah to the doctor. And um, the doctor, uh, Amanda was talking to her and shared with her how she went to uh, Illinois Aura to, to help in the packing of the shoe boxes for, uh, for OCC. And the comment that the doctor made was um, that many people do this, but there's poor people in our, in our own backyards. And she, was, she didn't say it in a mean way. It was just kind of matter-of-factly conversation. She wasn't trying to be ugly or mean. But, but she just said that there were poor people in our backyard, in our, own, in our own counties. Can I tell you those things are true? There are poor people here around us. But did you notice that Jesus didn't put a GPS location when he, when he mentioned these things? He didn't say he came here to the poor in his backyard. Now, if we read other parts of the Bible, we see that he had come to the Jews first. But he didn't just come, but we see that he ministered to Gentiles also. Can I tell you that we have been given a, a blessing and an opportunity to minister to the poor in other parts of the world? That's good. We should be uh, honored and blessed that we have given that opportunity. And we also have been given the opportunity to minister to the poor here in our own backyards. That's also true. He doesn't put a GPS location. He doesn't say do one but not the other. We're called to go to all the corners of the earth. We're called to go to all the brokenhearted, to all those that are, are, are hurt. That's who Jesus came for. There's no GPS location. And, and, and a lot of the times we think that it has to be done a certain way, but it's not. If we're given the opportunity and the blessing to be able to go to different parts, praise God. All glory go to him. We see these things, and, and, and I want to be very clear. These things here, these prophecies, are is a prophecy about the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. You can't heal a broken heart. You can't give eyesight to the blind. And neither can I. You cannot do any of these things. But can I tell you, you know who can? And the task that we've been given to as Christians is to point these people to the one who can. So I titled this message 2023 uh, uh, Vision. And uh, there's kind of a play on words. Um, as you guys may or may not know, 2020 is perfect vision. If you go and, and you look up the, the, the definition or the, 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 is this is the normal vision, okay? This is normal. What normal people will see 20 feet away. All right? So 2023 is, is not normal. It's not normal to have patience with someone who's not acting right. It's not normal to turn the other cheek when someone slaps you. It's not normal to continue ministering to people who are treating you bad. That's not normal. But we see that those are the people that Jesus came to. 
He came to, for the ones that mocked him as well as the ones that praised him. And Jesus knew their hearts, and yet he still ministered to them. We saw, we read it earlier, that Jesus knew their hearts, and yet he still delivered the message. Giving them an opportunity to know. It is very easy to preach and to minister to those who have show or showing an interest for Jesus. It's very hard to minister and to preach the gospel to someone who is persecuting you for your religion. We, re- we heard uh, Brother Josh heard a testimony about the people going into Pakistan. Can I tell you, those places persecute Christians? Those places kill Christians? Who in the right mind would have a desire to go into a place where they are persecuting you for what you believe? This thing that we open up every Sunday and Wednesday, but we keep close throughout the week, this thing here, people are dying to be able to have this. Why do we take this for granted? It's not normal to go and to want to minister. I wonder, you don't have to say it, but when we were praying praying for the Ukraine, how many of us prayed also for Russia? Why? Those are the ones that are causing the trouble. Why would you pray for them? That's what Jesus Christ came for. It's not normal. I heard testimonies, and it's just, uh, just, it amazes me how, how uh, uh, Christianity is unlike anything else. That those uh, Ukrainians who were being persecuted were praying for those who were persecuting them. To be able to kiss the person who killed your family, like we saw in the movie. That's not normal. That's not normal vision. He told him that the acceptable year of the Lord. And what I understood from this is today, today is the year, uh, the day of salvation. How many times did we hear the gospel and reject the gospel before we came to Christ? How many times did we turn our back You see, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is to say, I'm going to turn my back to sin and choose Jesus. That's what that means. We see that in the fall of mankind, in the fall of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, they chose sin and they turned their back to God. Whenever you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you do the other, you turn turn around the other way. You turn your back to sin. You turn your back to the way that that, that the previous desires, and you say, I want this. That's not normal. That's what Jesus Christ came for. We are entering a new year if the Lord will allow us. We're going to be entering 2023. And and, and the Lord up until this point has done wonderful things in allowing us to reach out to the corners, to other parts of the world. Also to be able to go into our backyard in Castellia and, and reach them to them. But how often have we done these things while complaining? How often have we done this with a bad attitude? Jesus said, I will save you, but I don't want to. That's not what he said, right? He said, they don't take my life, I give it. That's what he said. We have this thing, this notion, I will forgive you, but I won't forget. Have you heard that saying before? Well, I can forgive, but I won't forget. What if Jesus said that to you? I'll forgive you of your sins, but I won't forget. 
And every opportunity that I have, I'll bring it up to you. No, 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 that's not Jesus. That's Satan. He's the accuser. He's the one that appeals to you, appeals to God, and then comes and tells you, hey, listen, this is how big of a failure you are. That's not Jesus. Praise God for what he has given us and the ability to be able to go and do all these things. And I, I am fully persuaded just because I see the hearts of the people here. Their willingness to learn more, to have a closer relationship to God. That there's so much more that Christ can do with Sandhill to reach the lost. After all, that is the Great Commission. We talk about the victorious Christian life. The reason for the victorious Christian life is to bear his image to the lost world. That's the whole reason for it. It's not just to feel good about ourselves. We have a task to do. So I want to challenge you with something. I, I, Brother Richard gave you these handouts. So one of the tools that we do in, uh, in evangelism and, and, and trying to learn who to, to share our faith with or who to minister to. It's called an oikos map. And oikos is, is, is not a yogurt, all right? Oikos is just Greek, and it's just Greek for house. That's all it means, so a house map. So here on my map, I have my name here in the middle. And then all these people that are around me, all these people are people who are lost, all right? All these people here are the people who are brokenhearted those who are poor in spirit. All these people here are those who, uh, some of them have very nice, uh, monetarily speaking, they're, they're pretty good well off, but they're blind. Those are the people that I know, and there's many more, I didn't have time to fill this out. But I wanna challenge you, as, as you're entering into a new year, if you would fill out these papers, write your name in the middle, Put all the people that you know, whether it's co-workers, whether it's a son who's been lost for years, whether, whether it's a neighbor. And I wonder if you would, uh, you would dedicate time out of your day to pray for those people. To pray that those people in your life, the, those that, that you're able to reach, that they would find Christ. And not just that they would find Christ, or that they would receive the gospel, but that, that God would give you opportunities to minister to them. Meaning that when you do preach the gospel, that, that, that you, would, you would spend time with them, minister to them. I wonder if you would do that. We talk about the loss that are, that are in our lives. Would we dedicate time to pray for them? Begin with that. We talked about in Sunday school, if you were able to be here, about being radical, Right? We talked about that. Can I tell you that it starts with, with prayer? It's, it starts and continues with prayer? How about you pray for those things? We believe that God can do it, church. Amen? Let me ask that again. I know it's Sunday evening and some people are sleeping. We know that God can do it, church. Amen? Oh, I like that. He can do it. He did it for you. He did it for me. He can do it. And finally, I want to close with this. And this is the just the amazing part. This passage here that 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 was preached uh, or, or that was re written, uh, read, and preached from is from the book of Isaiah. Now. Hold your spot and turn to Isaiah 61. And I know that Josh is going to put it up on the board, but again, if you have your Bible, let's use it. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And you will notice a couple of things that are different. Say amen, we're there. The prophet, uh, in the, in the uh, word of the Lord says, and the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has 
sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are that are uh, bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And you notice that after the, the, the word Lord, after the, the letter D, there is a comma. Now, when Jesus read from this passage, there's a period. So something doesn't quite line up. We see that Jesus just stopped reading. And if you continue reading, you'll see why. You see, because the next part of that passage is in the day of vengeance of our God. The first coming of Jesus was to save this lost world. The second coming of Jesus is to bring judgment to this lost world because they rejected him. If you read all the way through the Bible, when you get to the book of Revelations, you will see this scene where all nations, all tongues from all over the world, they are worshiping the Savior. Meaning that the prophecies of Jesus, of him being able, his gospel being able to reach all over the world, were fulfilled. Not everyone accepted him, some rejected him, but everyone received the gospel. So my question to you is, are you going to be a part of the ones that help fulfill this prophecy? You see, while Jesus, while God could have chose angels to deliver this message, to deliver this good news, he chose us. He chose 11 disciples who had many flaws. He chose a, 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 a disciple named Peter who kept putting his foot in his mouth. That's the one that he chose. And he, 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 he uh, discipled, he modeled this format, this, this, this model of, of, of teaching his disciples and teaching them to make disciples that make disciples. And that has come all the way to us. The person who you received the gospel from received it from someone and it goes all the way back to Jesus. And that's amazing to think of. Will you continue in that process of discipleship making? Will you continue in that process of sharing the gospel can I tell you, that's not just for your pastors and your preachers. That's for all of us. And you might say to yourself, that's, that's not my role. I'm not that member. I'm not that part of the body. I'm not the mouth. I'm, I'm a hand. The gift that I've been given as a preacher is to be able to preach the word of God, to be able to stand up here and share with you. But each and every one of us are called to make disciples that make disciples. Each and every one of us are called to have Bible literacy, to be able to take this Bible, to be able to take the scriptures and understand them, to be able to take the things that God has given us. The same spirit that, 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 that was in Paul, that inspired Paul to write the scriptures, the same spirit that's in all those great preachers of yesteryear, and, 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 and the same spirit that's in Josh, and the same spirit that's in Pastor Gary, and the same spirit that's in Jacob, and the least of all, the same spirit that's in Miguel, that's the same spirit that lives inside of each and every one of you. You are able to take and understand the scriptures. So why are we not doing that? That's a good question. But we should be able to, church. We should be able to lead someone to the Lord. We should be able to do that. We talked about comfort. I'm not, I'm not talking about comfortable. I'm talking about confidence. How confident are you into leading someone to the Lord? Ask yourself that. How confident are you to lead someone to the Lord, to share with them the gospel? How confident are you to do that? And if they do accept it, how confident are you to be able to take them and disciple them? Well, that's not, that's not my job. That's the pastor's job. That's not what those scriptures teach. 
How confident are you in doing these things? I want to challenge you to think about these things. I want to challenge you to, for those people that are in your Oikos map, are you, can you confidently lead them to Christ? Not because of your ability, not because of how great you are, because of how great his word is. The pastor asked me today if the message was going to be good, and, and my answer was just simply, well, I have good material to work off of. It's the truth, right? It's not, it's not me. It's, it's, this is God's word. Of course it's going to be great. It's not because of me. It really isn't. I want to challenge us to do this, church. Take this serious. And it all begins with prayer. Commit yourself to praying for these people daily. And let's see how great God can work in their lives. Amen? If you will stand. As always, the altars are always open. The altars are uh, uh, someone is willing to pray for you. If there's anyone here who's, you know, I'm just not sure about. I'm not just not sure if I'm saved today. I'm not sure if I was to lay my head down tonight and it would be the last breath that I took if I would wake up with the Lord. I'm so broken hearted. I've tried. I've tried and I've tried only to be let down time and time again. If there's anyone here, would you just be bold enough to step up here and just see how great God is? See how God can take and heal your broken heart. Church, let me tell you, we cannot do this, but we know who can. We know who can give eyesight to the blind. We know who can set at liberty those that are captive. Those things were true then, and they're still true today, church. I want to encourage you to, to take these things serious, to, to, to think about these things, and just see how God can work. We don't have to wait to 2023 to see God's uh, work. How many testimonies can we have of seeing God do this, church?